Post-apocalyptia is one of the most prominent themes that games explore. The sheer number of games set after a zombie outbreak alone is a testament to this. While the catastrophic events that have caused these post-apocalyptic worlds to exist are undeniably important, there is a specific aesthetic element that I find most compelling, and that's landscapes. The destructors of society as we know it, whether it be a natural disaster, a resilient plague, or mankind's hubris, bring about not only a profound change to people's lives, but ignite a metamorphosis in terms of the environment. Why are we so obsessed with post apocalyptia in games, and how do the aesthetics play a part in it? It's without a doubt that a lot of people are drawn to the daydreams of our downfall, whether that's in the form of books, films, TV shows, or games. To be the last remaining survivors of a dangerous and unforgiving world is a fantasy that we wish to play out. It's that sense of freedom that comes with a world that has abandoned law and order. But nobody realistically wants to see their family and loved ones torn away from them by flesh-eating zombies or a nuclear disaster. So instead we play as someone who does have that happen to them. It's a morbid curiosity that we only feel safe experiencing without that kind of emotional commitment, and rightly so. It's a dark thought to envision yourself in this situation because as much as we point at our screens and criticise the actions of the characters, we would probably be annihilated in one way or another. Yet we'd like to believe that we would know what to do because that's far more comforting. So here we are, playing as characters who do survive and overcome their horrific circumstances, because we have the luxury to just observe from a distance. Plus, being one of the last alive in a post-apocalypse makes you someone important and skilled in this imaginary future, and who doesn't like to feel competent? Each apocalyptic world offers something different. Death Stranding and Horizon Zero Dawn imagine future technologies, but completely differ in the conversations surrounding them. In one, we have technology helping save and rebuild a society, whereas the other depicts it destroying civilization as we know it. The tech in Horizon Zero Dawn has become camouflaged in nature, with its robots similar to animals in appearance and behaviour. We hunt them for parts as we hunt animals for food, and despite the advanced tech inhabiting the planet, the lifestyles adopted by people are much more primitive in comparison. Likewise, Near Automata shows machines establishing a coexistence with the remaining creatures, both on land and underwater. Others have even begun to mimic humans, searching for meaning as their goal of wiping out humanity on Earth was accomplished a very long time ago. Death Stranding takes a look at the role of hobbies and play in a world filled with danger and death. It suggests that art would still be a factor in a world where your basic necessities are just about met. On the other hand, The Last of Us shows us that art has been forgotten, as we see paintings succumb to rot and neglect. Along with many other post-apocalyptic stories, it also inspects humanity and conscience in a world where you're more likely to survive without it. Raw human need can easily expose some of the ugliest sides of our personalities, and it's an extremely intriguing thing to explore. Besides, sometimes it's the good that comes out. We join together to recover and help each other. It's a lot more work, but the rewards are arguably greater than going it alone. There is so much to examine about mankind when there's not much left of it. It's back to square one as we see communities try to rebuild from the little that's still there, and in the cases of most of these games, we see that humanity does indeed survive. So while life obviously isn't the same as before, there's a new normal that is established, and we can at least find some comfort in that. From Nier Automata's flourishing greenery to the deserted deathscapes of Mad Max, and the flooded wreckages of Metro Exodus, there is no shortage of variety in terms of environment too. Along with it comes a sense of beauty, which I will discuss in more detail a little later. There is normally great freedom in traversal. Even in the most linear games, we are given many options in how we go about choosing our path to our destination. Will we take an offensive approach, or will we rely on stealth? And in situations where our stealth is compromised, how quickly can we run or switch to another strategy? We're on guard a lot of the time, but we're also given unnecessary moments to take a deep breath. The freedom of the post-apocalyptic lies with the lack of authority and rules, which is amplified by the interactive nature of video games. You are constantly given so many choices, the main being whether or not to use supplies sparingly. 
Dying Light 2 will have cities that completely change depending on what decisions you make. Aid the peacekeepers and you will see that the area will become more developed. However, running water and safer streets aren't without sacrifice, as the peacekeepers have a tyrannical approach to controlling the inhabitants. On the other hand, if you decide to not side with the peacekeepers during that initial choice, the city will have its freedoms, but that also attracts the wrong kinds of people. The post-apocalyptic is a cathartic release. We leave our heavily regulated lives behind for a more primitive lifestyle that focuses on survival, and in that way, it also makes you appreciate the small moments that aren't a part of that. The ambience of the post-apocalyptic is vastly different to those set in the midst of an apocalyptic event. The recent Resident Evil 3 remake begins right in the middle of Raccoon City's destruction. There are explosions, screaming civilians, and the horrific growling of the undead that are clashing against metal barriers fills the city. But as time moves on, you stumble into areas eerily silenced by the effects of the T-Virus. The game only covers a short period, but this kind of transition is amplified even further in the years that follow such an event. There's so much more noise and havoc in games set during or near the beginning of an apocalypse, but the post-apocalyptic worlds possess an entrancing sense of tranquility. Death Stranding is just one of those games. Although you have remainders of the chaos with areas infested with BTs, a lot of the world remains still. It's a calmness so isolating that it makes you feel simultaneously vulnerable and peaceful. In Simone Pizzagalli's essay, Spaces, Poetics, and Voids, he writes, Silence becomes a space more than a real void. A pause that is absent of sound but enriched by attention of meaning in itself as silence, or in relation with what was before and after. Vacancy is not devoid of significance. It can speak to us more than anything, and it's a quietude that even the starting screen of The Last of Us captures so perfectly. The art book for Horizon Zero Dawn illustrates the passage of time through the environment, showing the gradual reclamation of man-made structures. A blanket of vegetation builds up as the lines are slowly softened. The post-apocalyptic is reliant on decay, and it's romantic. We've always lived among ruins. We marvel at what's left of Pompeii and other ancient civilizations, and we like to imagine our distant past. These ruins help us piece together the puzzles in our heads. But these places also serve as a reminder that we will all crumble away eventually, no matter how powerful we may think our civilizations are. There is a word in German for this obsession with ruins, and that's the incredibly appropriate Runenlust. This infatuation made itself home in the arts. Artists like Hubert, Robert, and Gustave Doré imagined what cities like Paris and London would look like wearing an outfit of devastation. Then, in the year 1830, Joseph Gandhi envisioned the Bank of England as a ruin, depicting the fall of an empire just like that of Rome. We've always danced around the idea of our inevitable doom and our weaknesses, and not at the cost of beauty either. Art during the Romantic movement between the late 18th and mid 19th centuries depicted nature to be not only beautiful, but powerful, unpredictable, and destructive. These dramatic sunsets and mighty waves of the sea are humbling. We are shown how small we are in comparison, and that insignificance is so visually stunning. This movement in art is emotional and imaginative. It discards the values of order and reason that its predecessor, the Age of Enlightenment, held so dear. The post-apocalyptic is no stranger to nature's violence. Buildings are repaired by vegetation, and what man had been forced to abandon is now embraced by overgrowth. Although, instead of looking to the past of our ruins, we avert our gaze to the imaginary futures and alternate realities that video games portray. It's like looking at future fossils. Some ruins in our world aren't so far buried in the distant past, however. The tragedy of Chernobyl still attracts curiosity and fascination. And after HBO's miniseries in 2019, the city of Pripyat has seen increasing numbers of tourism. It's ironic to think that this abandoned disaster area has become busy in a sense, and unfortunately the commercialism has encouraged some ignorance towards the very real and terrible events that have destroyed so many lives. Whether or not video games that set themselves in a virtual Chernobyl are sensitive and respectful to the real events is a whole other discussion, but it's interesting to point out that these apocalyptic spaces aren't always fictional. Modern ruins will always remind us of our uncertainty. The buildings in The Last of Us are eerily unoccupied, with some displaying efforts of preservation and protection with boarded up windows and locked doors, yet ultimately we see they weren't enough. 
the game always lets you know the purpose of a space before the outbreak, whether that's visually or through the notes of those that were once there at a time. We get glimpses of these ghosts, and share a level of intimacy with them thanks to the inclusion of journals and audio logs left behind. We see continuous references of our lost innocence and comfort in the ruins of shops and homes, accompanied by caved-in roads and foundations, with vibrant greens thriving against the forgotten concrete. In Horizon Zero Dawn, there are stairways that reach to nowhere, and supports that have long since broken down. Frailty is evident throughout these concepts, evoking pity for those that once felt so comfortable and safe among these structures. As daylight streams through the window frames and reveals sections of collapsed walls, it almost seems like the trees that surround these broken buildings have come to pay their final respects. Wondrous structures worn out by nature are struggling to stand, and the lush ruins of these post-apocalyptic games are beyond aesthetically pleasing. The visual cues of decay are constant, the most common form being wilting traffic lights or a broken old car rusting away at the side of a road. So while we may become desensitised to the past that surrounds us, it will always be there. We do actually have moments where we are awoken to this blindness, like when Ellie asks questions about aspects of our normal lives that she can't even begin to comprehend. Characters born into these worlds don't see the purpose or meaning in the dilapidated objects around them, and they become part of the environment as a stone or a rotting log would be to us. These perspectives are a much needed wake-up call to add depth to our experience. It's not just about what was and remains, but it's also a reminder of what could exist in that space should the apocalypse have never occurred, and brings about a moment of melancholy. In Horizon Zero Dawn, for example, we look at the deteriorating shell of a stadium, and we recompose it in our imagination. A note in the art book reads, Aloy stands alone in what might once have been a busy thoroughfare, the overgrown setting of Far Cry from the bustle of burger stands, ticket booths, and fast food restaurants. She would have no concept of this, and we were encouraged to leave such imagery behind. The ruptured cities are littered with erasures. There are rips and tears in the fabric, along with parts where survivors attempt to patch things up. What were once homes become brutally exposed by the elements. With no keepers to care for it, all that's left is a husk of memories from those who once lived there. The buildings become man-made skeletons, but the junk inside turns into necessities for survival. In these kinds of buildings, spaces are empty and unused, yet filled with traces of events that happened at various times in the past, and whose characteristics, qualities, and unfolding within the spatial composition we can only try to imagine, while remaining unable to understand or be part of them. When looking at ruins, you get ideas of what may have happened, but the narration can only go so far. You may see the notes of a concerned father, but you're left wondering what happened to the children, and other times you find out the end of people's stories. You end up seeing so much tragedy that you assume the worst, and at the same time hoping for the best. The spaces left behind can be a liberation from the dominant spatial and cultural narrative of productivity and function that is tightening around our necks. The modern ruin offers the relief of imperfection. Decay triggers imagination and contemplation. All of a sudden, possibilities arise because time and space are no longer fixed within the usual conventions of functionality and beauty. The undefined nature gives people the opportunity to independently reinterpret places, histories, and futures, and perhaps even their own lives. The allure of these ruins is proven by something called urban exploration, or urbex for short. YouTube alone has no shortage of urbex content to sink your teeth into, but why are so many people into it? The main attraction of urbex lies with the thrill-seeking aspects of it, like the adrenaline rush of hiding from security or climbing a high place that could fall apart at any second. However, it can also play an incredibly important role in uncovering forgotten histories of these areas. Dereliction is captivating. The fact that such places can exist in cities that knock down, rebuild, and develop every inch of land they can is surprising for a lot of people. And in the video games I've discussed, that exact type of place is now almost everywhere. We have laws and regulations that dictate how space is used and how it looks, but in the worlds of the post-apocalyptic, it doesn't exist. And it's freeing. Perhaps that takes out some of the excitement and adrenaline from the often prohibited exploration of vacant properties, but with the many hazards lurking in these game worlds, you can't get too comfortable. Cities are looked upon in hope and disdain, 
There may be food and supplies scattered, but the dangers of monstrous beings or buildings on the edge of collapse are even more present. Perhaps other people desperately surviving have turned to hostility or cannibalism, and their dangers lurk too. Dying Light is the first title I think of when considering urban exploration in games, and its emphasis on parkour couples with it perfectly. The freedom of movement is immense, but it's not a hobby in the game, it's necessary for survival. Urbex relies on our bodies and basic equipment, rather than modern conveniences such as cars, elevators, and even stairs in some cases. Finding a way in is a puzzle to be solved when conventional entrances are barricaded by debris, and the same can be said for finding a way out. This of course becomes a much more anxious exercise when you're under pressure, especially that of zombies chasing after you as you make your frantic escape. So thanks to these apocalypses, cities are both playgrounds and death traps. Imagining and indulging in our demise is nothing new. Different arts and activities have always allowed this expression, but video games go further. With the new level of interactivity, we're able to navigate these worlds safely, and it has in turn brought about more unique explorations of our modern society through the lens of an imaginary future. Despite the pessimistic and catastrophic circumstances of post-apocalyptia, there is a sense of hope. Our curiosity doesn't just lie with the power fantasy of it, it's a desire for recovery and reconstruction. It's about patching up our broken world and learning from the past in order to rebuild something stronger.